An internal Vatican letter was leaked to LifeSite News detailing the planned release of an apostolic exhortation that will address the requests of the Amazon Synod. This exhortation is set to be released by mid-February, if not by the end of the month. The letter that LifeSite has is signed by Cardinal Claudio Humes, one of the modernists closely working with Francis on his quote-unquote reforms of the church. The apostolic exhortation is to have the same name as a preparatory document for the synod. New paths for the church and for an integral ecology, which by itself tells you a lot about what to expect. While a Dutch bishop recently made headlines for saying that the document will be an attempt to destroy the Catholic faith and that he hopes Francis destroys the synod with his exhortation, Cardinal Humes provides us an outline of what to read to prepare for Francis's document. And I did that for you, and that's what this video is. At least a short version of what to expect. So here you go. Share this with people who might actually care. Let's get to this. So using the reading list from the leaked letter as our outline, what do we have? First, the final document of the Amazon Synod was mostly a big, wet kiss to the United Nations and its sustainable development program, with a special emphasis on what we who study these things typically call social sustainability, which is a fancy way of saying cultural relativism. That document read like Laudato C2 and called for greater UN involvement in the region, management of natural resources, and learning from the indigenous peoples of South America in their relationship with the land. To call it eco-socialism is accurate, but kind of misses the overall point. The United Nations had been trying for many years to get involved in a very serious way in the Brazilian Amazon, and the current president of Brazil has long opposed their attempts, calling it an attack on Brazilian sovereignty. What we saw in the Synod was at least the hierarchy proposing to take sides in the sovereignty fight against the national interests of Brazil, which, while tragic in its own way, isn't that surprising, given the state of South American bishops at the moment. Yes, the Amazon Synod called for looking seriously at the issue of very probati, or ordaining married men to the clerical state, which the Germans have said they'll ask for if the South Americans are given this option in any form at all. Yes, we saw references to the demon who got an unexpected swim in the Tiber River, and yes, we saw calls for re-examining the issue of ahistorical deaconesses, you know, ones that didn't actually exist in history versus the ones that did. That may or may not be featured in this document, though. The purposes of the Amazon Synod was twofold, to further the overall theme of this papacy, which is embracing the vision that the UN has for the world, including its climate change agenda, and second, greater decentralization of the church as was seen in the all-but-forgotten Aparecida conferences in 2007, which called for a governance model for the church closer to that of the Anglican Communion. That is something we should be worried about because it is tantamount to an assault on the Sea of Peter itself, so keep an eye out for that. The second document is a letter for Francis's meeting with the indigenous peoples of Amazonia, dated January 1, 2018, a full almost two years before the synod kicked off. I have two excerpts that will prove instructive here, and they echo what I said about the Amazon Synod. The following extract is preceded by a quote from the book of Isaiah, which Francis uses to praise the Lord God for his creation of the Amazon people and the biodiversity they protect. Quote, this song of praise is cut short when we learn about and see the deep wounds that Amazonia and its peoples bear. I wanted to come to visit you and listen to you so that we can stand together in the heart of the church and share your challenges and reaffirm with you a heartfelt option for the defense of life, the defense of the earth, and the defense of cultures. The native Amazonian peoples have probably never been so threatened on their own lands as they are at the present. Amazonia is being disputed on various fronts. On the one hand, there is neo-extractivism, and the pressure being exerted by great business interests that want to lay hands on its petroleum, gas, wood, coal, and forms of agro-industrial monocultivation. On the other hand, its land are being threatened by the distortion of certain policies aimed at the conservation of nature without taking into account the men and women, specifically you, my Amazonian brothers and sisters, who inhabit it. We know of movements that, under the guise of preserving the forest, hoard great expanses of woodland and negotiate with them, leading to situations of oppression for the native peoples. As a result, they lose access to the land and its natural resources. These problems strangle her peoples and provoke the migration of the young due to the lack of local alternatives. 
We have to break with historical paradigms that view Amazonia as an inexhaustible source of supplies for other countries without concern for its inhabitants. I consider it essential to begin creating institutional expressions of respect, recognition, and dialogue with the native peoples, acknowledging and recovering their native cultures, languages, traditions, rights, and spirituality. An intercultural dialogue in which you yourselves will be the principal dialogue partners, especially when large projects affecting your land are proposed. Recognition and dialogue will be the best way to transform relationships whose history is marked by exclusion and discrimination. At the same time, it is right to acknowledge the existence of promising initiatives coming from your own communities and organizations, which advocate that the native peoples and communities themselves be the guardians of the woodlands. The resources that conservation practices generate would then revert to benefit your families, improve your living conditions, and promote health and education in your communities. This form of doing good is in harmony with the practices of good living found in the wisdom of our peoples. Allow me to state that if, for some reason, you are viewed as an obstacle or a hindrance, the fact is your lives cry out against a style of life that is oblivious to its own real cost. You are a living memory of the mission that God has entrusted to us all, the protection of our common home. End quote. See what I mean about this being so far about sustainable development, biodiversity, and decentralization. This is especially weird when combined with the UN agenda, though. But let's get to the second excerpt. It's much shorter. Quote, I likewise support all those young men and women of the native peoples who are trying to create from their own standpoint a new anthropology, and working to reinterpret the history of their peoples from their own perspective. I also encourage those who, through art, literature, craftsmanship, and music, show the world your worldview and your cultural richness. Much has been written and spoken about you. It is good that you are now the ones to define yourselves and show us your identity. We need to listen to you. End quote. Now, if you've been hearing about the Global Education Compact, here's a hint of what he's thinking about. Everything this pontificate does is aimed at something, and the document from the Synod that he produces will give us a lot of insight into exactly what that is. But let's move on. The next document cited in the letter is Francis's address at the start of the Synod called Opening of the Works of the Special Assembly, dated July 7th, 2019. That address in full is difficult to find, but I did find a good report on it from the Catholic Herald. Here is the pull quote of his remarks that is applicable here. Quote, when speaking of the people of the Amazon, Francis said, quote, Approach on tiptoe, respecting their history, their cultures, their style of buen viver, in the etymological sense of the word, not in the social sense that we often give it, he said. He condemned ideological colonialization and the desire by some to domesticate native peoples, expressing sorrow for times when the church did this, when it was not enculturized, the homogenizing and homogenization of centralism did not let the authenticity of the culture of the peoples emerge, he said. Ideologies are a dangerous weapon. We always tend to grab an ideology to interpret a people. Ideologies are reductive and lead us to exaggeration in our claim to understand intellectually, but without accepting. Understand without admiring. End quote. So we have the spread of the gospel reduced in part at least to an ideology of colonialism, which sounds to me like a call for religious indifferentism and relativism. This goes quite well with the call for a new right of mass being developed for the Amazon that will include elements of the Amazonian cultures, in ways not seen in the other rights of the church respective to their home cultures. I am, however, skeptical of that actually ever being produced. The third document cited is Cardinal Claudio Hume's letter to the Amazon Synod, where he openly rejects traditional Catholicism, and says that the real traditions of the church is to embrace change, that's kind of like saying that the true tra traditions of Texas are veganism, but I digress. He calls for new pathways in the Amazon, where the church embraces the cultures of the people of the Amazon and seeks to reject its colonial past. Again, this should all sound familiar to those who know much about liberation theology and the errors of the South American clergy that were condemned formally in the 1970s and 80s by the Vatican. Here's a long quote from that document to show what this will look like in practice. Quote, the Church's mission today in Amazonia is the Synod's central issue. This is a Synod of the Church for the Church, not an inward-looking Church, but one integrated in the history and the reality of the territory, in this case Amazonia, attentive to calls for help in the populations, aspirations in the common home, the creation. A Church open to dialogue, especially into religious and intercultural dialogue. A Church that is welcoming and wanting to share a synodal path with other Churches, 
religion, sciences, governments, institutions, peoples, communities, and persons. A church respecting differences with the intention of defending and promoting life for the populations in the area. Above all, those who originated there, while preserving biodiversity in the Amazon region. An updated church, Simper Reformanda, according to the Evangelii Gaudium. An outgoing missionary church, explicitly announcing Jesus Christ, welcoming and communicative, merciful, poor, for the poor and with the poor. Therefore, a church with a preferential, uncultured, intercultural, and increasingly more synodal attention paid to the poor. A Marian church fueled by devotion for the Most Holy Virgin, according to many local titles, especially that of Maria de Nazare, whose festivity brings together millions of pilgrims and faithful every year in Belém de do Pora. Enculturation of the Christian faith in the various different, different cultures is necessary. As St. John Paul II says about the missionary mandate of the Christian faith in the various different cultures, the need for such involvement has marked the church's pilgrimage throughout her history, but today it is particularly urgent. See Redemptoris Missio, paragraph 52. Together with enculturation, the evangelization of the peoples of the Amazon also requires paying particular attention to interculturality because it is there that cultures are many and diversified, although they continue to share a number of common roots. The task of enculturation and interculturality lies above all in the liturgy, in interreligious and ecumenical dialogue, in popular piety, in catechesis, in daily coexistence, in a dialogue with, auto with the autochthon peoples in social and charitable works, in consecrated life and urban pastoral care. End long quote. Here we have enculturation again, and the twisting of John Paul II's words to fit their agenda. That document can be summarized as the need to bring a new version of the Catholic faith that is culturally pagan to the locals because the church helped colonize South America centuries ago. How very dare we. That's how we understand what we're seeing here. The next text cited is Francis's final speech to the Amazon Synod, which frankly repeats all of this. The call to reform the church, be more inclusive of women, respect local cultures, and reject the church's historic past while claiming that enculturation is part of the history of the faith, it is all repeated here. A special focus is given to thanking the Eastern Orthodox patriarch Bartholomew, who was at least partially the inspiration for Lado Tosi, so thanks for that, I guess. The need to integrate our ecological understanding with social practices of culture is repeated ad nauseum here, and so we can expect to see more of that stuff in the document that is to be released later this month, or at some point in February. The final document cited is Laudato Si itself, chapters 5 and 6. Chapter 5 focuses on the need to dialogue with the scientific community, indigenous cultures, and political leaders to address the various ecological crises we're told that we face that will end civilization if we don't do something now. Dialogue, dialogue, dialogue. More dialogue. Except that Francis includes concrete action steps that lead to the development of policy to address the environment and protect indigenous cultures, so I guess that's a break from purely theological dialogue, which is no real purpose but to promote religious indifferentism. Chapter 6 of Laudato Si is focused on education, which is aimed at ecological conversion. Here is a quote that really matters. Quote, ecological education can take place in a variety of settings, at school, in families, in the media, in catechesis, and elsewhere. Good education plants seeds when we are young, and these continue to bear fruit throughout life. Here, though, I would stress the great importance of the family, which is the place in the which life, the gift of God, can be properly welcomed and protected against the many attacks to which it is exposed, and can develop in accordance with what constitutes authentic human growth. In the face of the so-called culture of death, the family is the heart of the culture of life. In the family, we first learn how to show love and respect for life. We are taught the proper use of things, order and cleanliness, respect for the local ecosystems, and care for all creatures. In the family, we receive an integral education, which enables us to grow harmoniously in personal maturity. In the family, we learn to ask without demanding, to say thank you as an expression of genuine gratitude for what we have been given, to control our aggressive aggressivity <laughs> and greed, and to ask forgiveness when we have caused harm. These simple gestures of heartfelt courtesy help to create a culture of shared life and respect for our surroundings. Political institutions and various other social groups are also entrusted with helping to raise people's awareness. So too is the church. All Christian communities have an important role to play in ecological education. It is my hope that our seminaries and houses of formation will provide an education and responsible simplicity of life, 
in grateful contemplation of God's world and a concern for the needs of the poor and the protection of the environment. Because the stakes are so high, we need institutions empowered to impose penalties for damage inflicted on the environment. But we also need personal qualities of self-control and willingness to learn from one another. In this regard, the relationship between a good aesthetic education and the maintenance of a healthy environment cannot be overlooked. By learning to see and appreciate beauty, we learn to reject self-interested pragmatism. If someone has not learned to stop and admire something beautiful, we should not be surprised if he or she treats everything as an object to be used and abused without scruple. If we want to bring about deep change, we need to realize that certain mindsets really do influence our behavior. Our efforts at education will be inadequate and ineffectual unless we strive to promote a new way of thinking about human beings, life, society, and our relationship with nature. Otherwise, the paradigm of consumerism will continue to advance with the help of the media and the highly effective workings of the market. End lengthy, lengthy quote. Here we see what the impetus behind the Global Education Compact with the UN really is. Remember, everything done in this pontificate is part of a larger push for greater global integration and a reduction or even elimination of natural sovereignty. I did appreciate the nod to the family there. That seems really rare these days, but again, don't miss the bigger picture. This is the UN agenda on steroids. In closing, this should all be viewed in a way that Claudio Hume states in his opening document that I cited already. Understand that he nails perfectly what Francis wants in the following quote. From the very beginning of his papal ministry, Pope Francis has emphasized the Church's need to move forward. The Church cannot remain inactive within her own closed circle, focused on herself, surrounded by protective walls, and even less can she look nostalgically to the past. The Church needs to throw open her doors, knock down the walls surrounding her, and build bridges, going out into the world and setting out on the path of history. In these times of momentous changes, the Church must always walk next to everyone, and especially those living on the margins of humankind. An outgoing church. Why outgoing? So as to turn on the lights and warm the hearts of those who help people, communities, countries, and all humankind to discover the meaning of life and of history. These lights are above all the announcement of the person of Jesus Christ, dead and risen, and of his kingdom, as is the practice of mercy as well as charity and solidarity above all towards the poor, those who suffer, the forgotten, and the marginalized in today's world, such as migrants and indigenous peoples. End quote. There is clearly a view held by those in Rome that the church has been inwardly turned, and as such needs to reject its belief of being the one true source of wisdom in the world, and instead open itself to the wisdom of other non-Catholic cultures, some of whom hold beliefs that are antithetical to Christianity, like we see in some practices in the Amazon today. This is the sad truth, and I am reminded of the warning from an apparition of Our Lady, where she warned that those leading the church would reject its historic mission, be ashamed of its past, and, well, that all sounds an awful lot like what we're seeing today. Maybe we're expecting to hear about the Pachamami demon. Maybe we were expecting to have a greater focus on the so-called need to ordain married Skittles men to the priesthood. But remember, the political activism of the present regime is the real focus here, and don't lose sight of that. Yes, some of that may play into the overall changes called for, but remember, this is about the bigger secular political agenda, and that is a tragedy itself. Anyway, let me know your thoughts on this in the comments below. As always, all the resources that I used here, all the things I cited, can be found on the Sources blog, which is linked in the description of this podcast. Thank you for listening. I'm Anthony Stein. Viva Cristo Rey.